You are watching Breakthrough News, and this is The Freedom Side. I am one of your hosts, Eugene Perrier, here as always, alongside my intrepid co-host, Rania Kalik. Rania, as always, good to be back with you. It's good to be back on with you, Eugene. Excellent. Well, it's good to be back here with all of our viewers, of course. So thank you all for joining us. Great show. Of course, we're going to be touching on many different things from Mexico to Gaza to the uh, terrorist attack which took place in Moscow, the Baltimore Bridge collapse. So all sorts of fantastic content and fantastic guests to inform you on all these topics. So good time to remind you since you are here on YouTube watching us that you should hit subscribe and then hit the bell so you get the alerts about the things you subscribe to because it's not just here on Thursdays on the Freedom Side we have great guests informing you about many many things, but all throughout the week with many of our different shows and content, including Dispatches with Rania Kalik. So again, hit the subscribe button and then hit the bell so you get the alerts for the things you subscribe to. That way you don't have to look very far at all for all the excellent content here on Breakthrough News. Rania, is there other, are there other factors, other things that you want our viewers to consider as we start the show? Uh, always. So thank you for asking. Uh, first and foremost, for those who are watching, make sure you hit that like button or should I say smash that like button. Smash that um, like it, button. <laughs> love it. I love it. That never gets old. Uh, smash that like button so that we, it can help boost us in the algorithm. Uh, just do, don't listen to Eugene's head shaking or eye rolling and do what I'm telling you to do with my smile which is to smash that like button. Um, it helps boost us in the algorithm. And moreover, uh, you can help support the show by becoming a member of Breakthrough News. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash breakthrough news and becoming a patron where you can access exclusive content, access exclusive merch, such as this very cool coffee mug, uh, mug or, or water mug. I'm drinking water from it. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry for the lipstick stain, but it happens. Um, but more importantly, I mean, I really do encourage people who have the means to, to 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 become patrons, not just for the exclusive content and really cool merch, but also because independent media is more important than ever in this moment in time with a genocide taking place in Gaza, with uprisings um, ongoing across West Africa and beyond. Uh, you know, we do bring you coverage from parts of the world that nobody else really pays so much attention to uh, in, in the media sphere. So if you appreciate this kind of content, if you appreciate independent journalism, which if you're watching, I imagine you do, help keep it going, help keep it growing by becoming a member at patreon.com slash breakthrough news. Indeed, indeed. Patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. We really appreciate it. Everyone who is out there watching who's a patron already, big shout out to you. Thanks so much. We've actually had a number of patrons over the past uh, week here. So shout out to all of our new patrons this week. Many, many thanks to you. And of course, all of our old patrons for making it possible to continue to, to bring you this show and to, to do everything that we do. So uh, with that said, Rania, I think we can just jump right into our show today. We want to start with the country of Mexico, who is uh, just about to have another presidential election. And certainly if you live in the United States, you hear a lot about Mexico, but you don't hear a lot of uh, substantive content from my point of view, let's just say that. So we are really, really excited to have with us today Kurt Hackbarth, who's a writer and journalist with Jacobin Magazine, also the host of the Soberania Mexican Politics Podcast. Kurt, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much, Ron Eugene. A pleasure to be on today. Well, really a pleasure to have you. Uh, some, I think some people probably have some sense that Mexico has an election that's upcoming here relatively soon. Um, maybe just to start, give us uh, uh, some, some basic context. Who's running? What are some of the major issues? Sure. Um, so um, in beginning of June, um, Mexico is going to be having its next presidential election. Um, there are three parties in the running. Morena, which is the party of the very popular Andres Manuel López Obrador, is well ahead in the polls against a conservative coalition of uh, three parties. Uh, the once hegemonic PRI, which has fallen on bad times very happily. Uh, the very right-wing uh, PAN, 
a conservative Catholic party and um, a very a smaller party called the PRD. And there's also a, a third party candidate from a party called Movimiento Ciudadano, which is polling uh, around 5%. The good news for the left is that uh, Morena is doing very well in the polls uh, and is uh, en route to having um, Mexico's first woman president in Claudia Scheinbaum, who is ahead by 25 to uh, 35 uh, points in the polls um, against the conservative candidate uh, Xochitl Galvez. Um, the major issues in the campaign are basically the continuity of what's called uh, the fourth transformation in Mexico, which has been... Lopez Obrador's package of um, energy reforms to bring more sovereignty into the energy field in Mexico and make it uh, energy self uh, independent, together with a series of social programs such as pensions, scholarships, a doubling of the minimum wage, pro union reforms, uh, and such. So, you know, in this case, uh, with AMLO's popularity being high, uh, being the continuity candidate is um, is a positive thing, and. Um, Morena is looking good uh, so far, despite, and I think we'll talk about this too, uh, attempts from the international media to, uh, to intervene as much as they can. And, you know, you recently wrote a piece about this, Kurt, uh, for Jacobin called The Campaign to Smear AMLO as a Narco. Uh, and you break down the various ways that think tanks and mainstream corporate media have sought to slander not just uh, AMLO, but also Morena. Uh, the party that he represents, um, that, you know, his six, soon to be potential successor, Claudia Scheinbaum, if she wins the presidential election, would be leading the country after him uh, for that same party. So can you talk a bit about why is the why are the cap? Why are the like ruling class capitalists of North America working so hard to smear AMLO? What is this? What is the threat that he represents to their interests? And why is he, in fact, not in alliance with uh, drug traffickers, as they seem to be trying to claim? Yeah. Um, one point is what I just uh, mentioned, which with regards to uh, energy reform. Uh, a big uh, effort that AMLO has made over the course of his presidency is to take uh, greater control, public control over Mexico's uh, energy uh, sector and strengthen Pemex, the uh, national oil company strengthened uh, the Federal Electricity Commission. He recently uh, purchased a series of power plants from uh, the Spanish multinational Iberdrola to add to the public grid um, <clears throat> to strengthen uh, Mexico's energy sovereignty. So, you know, energy multinationals don't look at that kindly. That's one thing that the United States has never uh, pardoned, which is a country having control over its own energy of its own natural resources, and that includes the nationalization of lithium. So interestingly, in January, uh, the Baker Institute, which is a supposedly nonpartisan think tank at uh, Rice University, which is really a nexus of energy interests, Texas being, you know, the oil capital, but brings together energy interests from across the world, comes out with its Mexico Outlook Report from 2024 and just throws in there, just throws in there that uh, um, the Morena Party and drug traffickers are going to be in alliance in uh, in this year's uh, election. No proof, no evidence. They just throw it out there. Then the director of the Mexico uh, Center at Baker, Tony Payan, gives an interview to the Texas Observer where he injects that into the U.S. media um, uh, bloodstream. And then from there, it hops into Mexico and then reform a newspaper and spreads out. In the United States, they see an alliance between Morena and drug traffickers in this year's election. So that's step one. Then a couple of weeks later, there's this coordinated, you know, series of articles on the exact same day. You get ProPublica, you get Insight Crime, and you get Deutsche Welle coming out with an investigation that there was supposedly um, drug money uh, involved in AMLO's first presidential campaign in 2006. The problem is that, you know, all of these investigations were based on an unreliable witness, Roberto Lopez Najera, who was a former operator from the Beltran uh, labor cartel. Um, and basically what all they were doing is rehashing a closed investigation from over a decade ago, very coincidentally, right at the beginning of a next election here. So faced with all this blowback from Mexico saying basically what the hell, uh, Steven Engelberg, the editor of ProPublica comes out, um, and tries to say, no, there really was, you know, something there because the original article said that basically prosecutors were underwhelmed, didn't find anything and closed the case, right? Over a decade ago, of course, they would have used this against AMLO in 2012 and 2018 had there really been anything there. 
So um, really the real revelation in that ProPublica report was that the DEA was trying to set up the AMLO campaign in 2011 and trying to entrap operatives in the campaign uh, with a $5 million sting operation. This at the time that the then security minister um, for the Calderon government, Genaro Garcia Luna, was um, in open cahoots with the Sinaloa cartel, something that strangely the DEA saw no evil and heard no evil about that. So, <clears throat> you know, and then Engelberg reveals that the DEA actually asked them to change parts of the article and actually they postponed the piece um, because the DEA requested it. As if that weren't enough, and the New York Times comes out with a piece a couple weeks later saying that, I mean, it's funny that they just come one after the other after the other in a one month period, <clears throat> that uh, there was supposedly drug money in AMLO's 2018 campaign. They gave no proof. They gave no evidence. It was all very vague. It was like a game of telephone, you know, that you play with kids. Somebody said that somebody else said that some other person heard that there were videos or something, but we don't know, right? And from there, this just becomes then a whole hashtag campaign, Narco Presidente, right? AMLO Narco, Claudia Narco. Um, and, you know, the troll armies and the bot farms get involved. Um, it's funny that because of a series of spelling errors in the hashtags, you know, my, my being an editor, I really like the fact that they were able to trace all of this because of spelling errors. Um, they traced these bot farms to Spain, to Argentina, to Colombia, we were just using all of this and these, you know, these bogus articles from the U.S. to try to play up the idea of narco AMLO, narco presidente, narco Claudia, narco Morena, narco everything, right? To the tune of some 200 million views and reproductions, which AMLO kind of joked would even beat out uh, the Super Bowl. Um, and the kind of the good news of all this, to not extend too much, is uh, there's a happy ending. <laughs> AMLO's popularity rating went up 11 points over this period. Mm. And Claudia went up five points uh, in the polls. So I really think this is kind of a part of a worldwide rebellion against Western corporate media across the board. You know, and I think it also touched on an important issue, too, in terms of AMLO's presidency that I was hoping you could sort of talk about and maybe help contextualize is that he has been promoting a different approach to the issue of the war on drugs than what has been promoted for, for so many years by the U.S. and successive Mexican governments. Yes, um, <clears throat> that's a, an important one. And that just um, kind of came out into the open when Amla was interviewed uh, this last week on uh, 60 Minutes, right? And um, his new approach was laid out in four points, right? Which is basically, uh, first of all, uh, a $20 billion uh, program um, to support um, social programs in Central American countries where, you know, there's been uh, migration. Mexico is itself already investing uh, in, in these um, in these countries, uh, a legalization of Mexicans who've been, you know, law-abiding citizens who've been in the country for more than four or five years, right? And some very important uh, points here, and the sanctions on Venezuela and end the embargo on Cuba, because as the president very clearly said in an interview, you know, you can try all kinds of short-term approaches, but you are never going to address the um, immigration issue without addressing historical U.S. complicity in supporting intervention and coups and sanctions and embargoes and, you know, a raft of other interventions uh, throughout the history of, you know, of Latin America, the famous open veins uh, of Latin America. Um, and it's really funny that um, U.S. social media just couldn't handle that, at least a segment of it. If you look at the 60 minutes, you know, they, they tweeted out AMLO's proposal, just a series of hysterical, hysterical responses to a very moderate proposal. $20 billion is nothing for the United States compared to, you know, a military budget over of over 800 billion plus, you know, the billions more the United States is spending to devastate, you know, countries uh, in other parts of the world, right? Um, a legalization program is, you know, uh, elemental justice and the sanctions in the, in, in the embargo, this is a fundamental to address the root cause uh, of all of this. And the response from so many people in the U.S. is this is a blackmail. I'm those blackmailing us as if, you know, the fact that Mexico dared to make a counter proposal, right, to the U.S.'s proposal, which is basically the same as always, you know, um, security wall, uh, you know, U.S. guns flow into Mexico basically unimpeded, right? Um, all of the money that has been coming into Latin America from U.S. Um, aid over the years has gone into security cooperation and more policing and more, you know, more military and more weapons and more this and fast and furious. It hasn't worked. It's just killed people. 
it's just killed hundreds of thousands uh, of Mexicans and others, right? And I think, you know, the cry coming from Mexico is, why do we keep having to put the bodies here? Why do we have to keep dying for this, right? <laughs> and it's funny that um, the response was so hysterical to, you know, a Mexican president doing what a Mexican president should be doing, which is <laughs> making a proposal and advancing, you know, uh, his country's point of view. Yeah, I mean, just last year, the U.S. was threatening to like, or U.S. M members of Congress and the Senate were threatening to invade and bomb Mexico. So insane. Um, but, you know, as we approach this election, uh, I'm curious if you can explain to our audience, like, what's on the line here? Uh, so you've kind of explained what the Morena party to some degree has done, what they stand for. What are they up against? I mean, you said that they're up in the polls. Um, who are their adversaries and what interests do they represent? And what are the chances that yeah. Bernardino will win or lose? Um, <clears throat> things are looking good for Morena uh, right now. Um, but, you know, you, no puedes cantar victoria, as I say in Spanish. You can't, you know, sing victory beforehand, right? <clears throat> because the opponents are, are very powerful, right? So you have multinational energy interests. You have basically the entirety of the Mexican press, which is against, um, you know, which is against Morena and against AMLO. And that includes public and private media, the public channels, the private channels, all of the newspapers, save one, right? Um, <clears throat> you've got um, some very powerful uh, interests with regards to um, pharmaceutical interests. You've got interests uh, right now. AMLO's government is trying to ban uh, genetically modified corn and glyphosate. So, you know, you've got all of those big ag um, opposition there as well. So it's it's quite a uh, <clears throat> it's quite a range. Right. And also, um, you know, international networks like the Atlas uh, Network. Right. Which has you know different organizations uh, active uh, in Mexico and just hosted an event here uh, with a, a speaker from uh, Spain's uh, Partido Popular. Right. So all of the far right interests, you know, constellated around uh, the Atlas Network, and of course the U.S. satellites, the U organizations funded by USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy, right? Because they fund opposition organizations here. So you know, it's quite a constellation. So I think you've got to give a lot of credit to the movement here, <clears throat> you know, which has suffered through electoral frauds and stuff over these decades to have um, achieved uh, power peacefully. And, you know, in the face of, you know, a daily onslaught, you know, as I just talked about, you know, AMLO Narco is just the latest iteration of, a, you know, of an onslaught over years, has, you know, maintained their popularity and, you know, is, is looking good. What's at stake? What's at stake is, um, you know, what the president refers to as uh, the transformation of the country. Right? Um, you know, before, prior to 2018, there was no, you know, old age, national old age pension here. Um, you know, lithium was still uh, in, in, in private hands. You know, the minimum wage was was basically a, sta a slave wage. Uh, it's still too low, right? Um, there's now a plan in the works with Claudia Scheinbaum to bring back a national uh, rail system, right? Um, you know, all of this, you know, unions were 90% um, company unions. I mean, this was this was the the the, the capture you know, the elite capture of the Mexican, uh, you know, democratic system. So you see an opening there. You see a democratic opening and you see, you know, <clears throat> an economic opening. There's more to go. And that's what I think. I think voters really see this as this is a generational change. You know, this is something that, you know, is going to be a multi-term uh, process. And Claudia Scheinbaum is now, you know, has put her own emphasis and accent on this. She wants to now um, drop down the, the, the pension age for women, um, to 60 from 65, right? She wants to, she's a climate change engineer. She's got a whole uh, series of, uh, of climate change uh, proposals. Mexico's in the midst of a water crisis, you know, as are a lot of parts of the world. Um, so it's exciting times. And I think part of the reason the opposition is so far behind is that they haven't articulated anything behind, anything besides, let's go back to the way things were. And people are like, the way things were, were pretty bad. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I was there in 2018, and it was just amazing to see the the enthusiasm for people to turn the page on on so many years uh, of of poor misrule. Well, Kurt, we really appreciate you. Real quick, before we let you go, where can people find your byline and find you on social media? 
Yeah, thanks so much. And, you know, I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for what you're doing uh, with regards to, to, to Gaza. That's so, so important. And millions of us are really uh, appreciative of that. Um, <clears throat> I'm in uh, Jacobin and Jacobin Magazine. I publish monthly on uh, Mexico and Latin America. I'm also in the Mexican uh, magazine Revista Sentido Común uh, on Twitter at Kurt Hackbarth. And we've also got our podcast, Soberanía, the Mexican politics podcast with Jose Luis Granados Ceja and uh, English language coverage uh, of what's going on in Mexico to break out of this, you know, just just awful, awful <laughs> U.S. Uh, mainstream media uh, build. Right? So uh, we're happy to be there. And um, thanks again for having me. Right on. No, we're happy to have you, Kurt Hackbarth. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again soon, hopefully, as this keeps going on. Thanks for joining us on the Freedom Side. Take care. Well, Kurt's wonderful, and I just want to note, I, I had him on Dispatches last year uh, to go really in-depth into uh, Morena, what they've done, uh, the various different political forces in Mexico. So definitely go check that episode of Dispatches out if you are interested in understanding the landscape of Mexican politics a bit more. Indeed. You also interviewed Claudia Scheinbaum with uh, Zoe Alexandra from People's Dispatch. Uh, that's also available, of course, if you check us out here on YouTube after the show. But uh, she's going to be the next president of Mexico almost certainly. So and, very, very notable. And I'll add for those who are <laughs> don't like reading subtitles, it's actually in English. She speaks in English <laughs> in the interview. Hey, yes, I know it makes a difference. She studied here. People, that's one so. of the yeah. slurs against her is that she's really an American. Um, I'm not joking. That's one of the well, things they've tried to throw out there. I mean, she is technically an American if we consider what America Yes, As, you know, yes. the American United name, States so. citizen. OK, so yeah, yeah, I, I understand. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow, uh, Eugene. <laughs> Called out. <laughs> Listen, I love Mexico. People in Mexico. Great country. Maybe we'll even get a chance to go there for this year's election. Uh, super, super yeah. important election for the United States, even though people don't see it that way. Um, and also shout out to Alina Duarte, a uh, good friend there. Great Mexican journalist. Also launched a great new independent news outlet recently. So anyway, just leaving that where it is. Um, important issue. We'll keep covering it. We want to move now to another critically important issue. Tragic issue, of course. Uh, what took place in Moscow, the mall shooting. Uh, I think we're now at maybe 143 people died. Just terrible situation. But a lot swore swirling around uh, this terrorist attack, and we are very, very honored to be be joined, ooh, excuse me, by our very own world-famous Kay Pritzker, journalist with Breaking News. Hey, welcome. Hey, guys. Good to be here. Oh. What's going on with that audio, Kay? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it it's almost sounds like your mic isn't work working, that, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. we'll fix this. We'll get Kay back. This is an sounds important like, issue. It might. It's. it's I think like it's his laptop. Like, it, it sounds like it's maybe a little water or something in the microphone or something. Anyway, I was we'll gonna get say to it that. sounds like somebody. Sounds like somebody took the cord that connects the mic to the laptop and dr like dropped it in water and left it there for about thirty minutes and then plugged everything back in. People trying to sabotage. That's what us, happened. Man. People Not trying to sabotage stuff. us. Yeah, for it. I mean, I was gonna. I wasn't gonna mention it, but since we have a little bit extra time now, mm -hmm. uh, there was two attempts. <laughs> On me and Eugene today. One person, okay, or okay, one person. No. I, br Eugene, I, I have Eugene a tiny cut. And that I almost like lost it. <laughs> I'm a little, I, I might, okay, sometimes I'm a bit dramatic, which means that when Eugene told me he has a cut on his finger, I was like, wow, it sounds like somebody tried to like amputate your finger. Yeah, I'm 100% fine. Don't, no one be I concerned. Mean, it's like so a little concerned. I feel like we it. need some security around Eugene. <laughs> Well, listen, I, well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, I like <laughs> Amlo when he was running for office. He had very little security. So I'm just in his in his base. I once I was like very close to him in the 2018 election. And like the only security he had with these like five, like 55 year old, like Harley motorcycle dudes. It was a wild. I mean, look, <laughs> I went to I went to with uh, Zoe Alexander from People's Dispatches when we were in Mexico City to interview Claudia Scheinbaum. We went to one of. Um, his uh, daily manianeras. Mm, the, yeah, like, the morning press conference conferences. Yeah, gives every day. Yeah, and it's super accessible. And I was just kind of like, wow, this is the president. Cool. Yeah, and he speaks um, like at length and about it. It just, yeah. it's just one of those things where you just really oftentimes realize the very like low quality of U.S. political representatives because Amlo oh, yeah. would just be going deep, like just like two hours on, you know, something that happened like two hundred years ago in history, giving context. <laughs> 
uh, no notes, no anything, you know, just dropping knowledge. And oh, you know, no, no, no. Have, when like, I was there, when I was there, he gave a two hour like PowerPoint presentation, mm. like point by point deconstructing Lindsey Graham's like crazy accusations against his government. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the idea really of drone good, strikes actually. that they were saying, unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. Mexico is like, I think the largest trade partner of the United States. Uh, the countries are so interlinked. I believe there's something like 35 million people of Mexican heritage here in the United States. Obviously, a number of Americans live in Mexico. So the idea that we would be going to war with them and bombing them, it just unbelievable and the level of racism that comes behind it you know i mean i think that's one of the elements of this rania and i I think kurt's article about the smearing of amlo as a narco is really good because it it goes to like i think the heart of the racist demonization that the fact that people would even just like believe this you know what i'm saying like uh like oh yeah of course it makes sense like he was the president of mexico he must be some sort of narco dictator or something like that i mean just all and of course you know this is all built up by all the tv shows and you know the second Mm -hmm. Uh, season of narcos is about mexico um and whatever i could say about the show artistically you know all these kinks they start to add up over time and you know people listen people used to always sort of make fun of italian americans who would make the point of when everything's about the mafia people think we're all in the mafia and there but there's a certain truth to it you know what i mean and so if everything you ever see about mexico is like cartels people getting murdered all this other stuff you never hear about you know the big social movements you never hear about the history of arts and culture i guess except for the freedom movie you know what i'm saying but you go to mexico city it's one of the great art cities of the world you know but you're not getting a hundred shows about that but you can get a show somehow some way about some drug dealer it goes to the top of the charts i mean mexico is a country of like 120 million people or something it's a humongous country and it is flattened out into drug cartels like yes. that's i mean imagine a country uh, 120 million people that's like almost half of america you know what i mean it is. that's huge and you're literally just like oh and like people of different basically like different races mm. uh there's we have k back like, like, sorry to interrupt indigenous oh Okay, well, yes, we'll no, but very important oaxaca the other parts in southern the indigenous mexican population crucial thing we'll talk more about that k welcome back Hey, yeah, good to be back. I got, Ooh, got you from Zoe Alexandra from Wow. Saving Shout us. out to Zoe. Definitely. Saving us. Constantly uh, saving breakthrough news. Zoe Alexandra, <laughs> superhero. <laughs> well, Kay, we appreciate you coming through to help us sort through this. Obviously, there's, there's, there's so much swirling around what took place in Moscow. And, of course, I think the big question that people are, are having is, you know, who did it? Uh, obviously ISIS or allegedly ISIS K in Afghanistan has claimed credit for it. Uh, you know, the Russian government is saying that Ukraine, uh, is behind it. There's debate about maybe they were even working together on some people. So there's all this sort of swirling thing. I I mean, I I guess I just wonder really, what do you think about the, uh, about this, even this debate in and of itself around, you know, the who done it when we don't really know exactly what's going on yet? Yeah, I mean, you know, this this whole debate is almost misframed, um, especially on the U.S.'s side, because, you know, they're saying ISIS was this, the sole one involved or the sole group involved. But regardless of who pulled the trigger, I mean, I think any discussion of this topic has to start with who actually where ISIS actually comes from. And that's from the United States. ISIS came out of the power vacuum that was created after the U.S. invaded Iraq uh, destroyed its government, destabilized the country, and demobilized the the Baathist government and uh, the Iraqi army, which left a bunch of people out on the street with guns and no jobs. And of course, they went and formed groups like Al Qaeda in Iraq, and then eventually ISIS. You know, you talk about where ISIS K comes from, the ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan that's accused of orchestrating this attack. I mean, they came out of the power vacuum that was created when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan and, you know, put tried to put all these puppet governments in power and failed and eventually handed the government over to the Taliban, which created an environment where these sort of Wahhabist uh, Islamic fundamentalist groups could sort of thrive in. So uh, from that angle, I mean, the U.S. can't really escape this. And moreover, I mean, the U.S. really Wahhabism and Islamic fundamentalism is in and of itself, sort of a U.S. creation. I mean, it was not only the U.S. that funded and armed the Taliban that, uh, you know, 
trained and supported Osama bin Laden when he was fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan, but they also forged this relationship with Saudi Arabia and was really behind Saudi Arabia's diplomatic pivot to exporting Wahhabist ideology. You know, they went to Saudi Arabia and they said, your enemy isn't, it's not Israel, it's not the West, it's not imperialism, your enemy is communism, your enemy is, you know, the sort of atheistic Soviet Union. And they started flooding the world with uh, Wahhabist textbooks, building Wahhabist schools in, in Pakistan, throughout the Islamic world, with a lot of the money that they got through this uh, oil deal they struck with the U.S. So even from an ideological perspective, um, the spread of Islamic terrorism or, you know, uh, radical Islam, Wahhabist ideology is in and of itself a U.S. Uh, creation. And then, you know, you talk about the spread of ISIS. I mean, what is ISIS doing in Afghanistan? What is ISIS doing in Tajikistan, where these uh, where these uh, terrorists that carried out the attack were based out of? I mean, the U.S. then launched wars in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, in Somalia, and created more power vacuums for ISIS to spread all around the world outside of uh, just the Levant, they've now spread to West Africa. They've spread to the Arabian Peninsula. They've spread to South Asia. I've even heard there's ISIS in the Philippines. You know, so the United States and U.S. foreign policy is behind the spread of ISIS, of these uh, terrorist groups, this ideology behind these terrorist groups. So to just say, oh, well, ISIS, they're the ones that planned the attack. I mean, who created ISIS to begin with? And, you know, uh, who created all these contradictions and all this tension surrounding Russia right now? Uh, you know, that was obviously very likely linked to this attack. Well, I'm a little bit confused about this particular branch of ISIS in the sense that like every country it hates is, happens to be an American adversary. <laughs> Or a country. I mean, it is weird, right? Like, it's just super weird. So this particular branch of ISIS, like, hates Iran. Uh, doesn't, like, it, it does attacks in Afghanistan and hates Russia. And my question is, is this, like, an ally of the U.S.? <laughs> like, I don't know where you're, where else your mind's supposed to go from that. But also, I mean, more importantly, the Russians themselves, like, the Russian government is claiming some sort of Ukrainian involvement. So what what are your thoughts on that, Kay? Is it plausible there was some Ukrainian involvement? I think at some point some Ukrainian official uh, tried to suggest that this was, no, this was some Russian false flag to try to make Ukraine look bad. And I'm like, all right, now everyone's just accusing everyone of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, explain all this to me because I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think to start off... Uh... The fact that the, the U.S. came out and said like a few hours after the attack that ISIS is uh, the sole responsible party, that there's no signs of Ukrainian involvement. I mean, this is before Russia had even detained the suspects. This is before they gave their confessions. This is before they appeared in court. The U.S. somehow already knew that Ukraine wasn't involved. And it's like, how did how did they know that? Um, you know, it's almost like they just threw out their their narrative on this and, you know, they said, OK, you know, we'll, we'll make the, the facts align after the fact. But, you know, is it so preposterous? I mean, this is what the U.S. keeps saying, that it's ridiculous for Russia to suggest that there's Ukrainian involvement. And I mean, is it, it it's preposterous to say that Ukraine might have, you know, had a hand in this? I mean, Ukraine has been at war with Russia for the last two years, uh, you know, you, the, of course, they have, you know, it's not like they don't have some incentive to see an attack like this happen. But, you know, I think also when you look at the rhetoric that's been coming from Ukrainian leader, not not just the Ukrainian leadership, but also U.S. leadership calling Russia, you know, a terrorist state saying uh, they're monsters, they're barbarians, they have to be stopped at all costs. When you hear things like this coming out of the leadership of not just your own country, but of this military superpower that's backing you, is it so preposterous to believe that, you know, Ukrainians or someone that sympathized with Ukraine might have heard this and have taken this, you know, taken this literally? I mean, if you're talking about a terrorist state, I mean, why would you, you know, you could see how someone might feel like, oh, I need to take this into my own hands. But moreover, um, you know, on the socialist program, Brian uh, raised a very interesting quote from Mark Milley, who was uh, who's a one of the top generals in the U.S. military. 
And he said about three months ago, addressing Ukrainian forces, I have, I have the quote here. He said, there should be no Russian who goes to sleep without wondering if they're going to get their throat slit in the middle of the night. You've got to get back there and create a campaign behind enemy lines. So right there, you basically have marching orders, like straight up marching orders, calling for a military campaign behind Russia's lines. So within Russia to slit their throats, to make Russians fear to go to sleep every night, fearing that their throats will be slit. How are we you, you, how are we actually supposed to believe that it's preposterous that, you know, Ukraine had no hand in this when you literally have. Ukrainian military and also U.S. military officials literally calling for a covert campaign behind Ukrainian, U, sorry, behind Russian lines. But I think um, what takes the cake, I think the most damning piece of all of this is that Ukraine has been involved in attacks like this before. They were uh, uh, involved in the Samara railway bombing, which happened inside Russia. It was a railway that was transporting ammunition to to the Russian front lines, it was bombed. And a few hours after the attack, Ukraine posts photos bragging about how it's paralyzed Russia's supply lines, how it's paralyzed all this ammo is being held up. Um, you have the Daria Dugin assassination, which, you know, Daria Dugin was uh, the daughter of a very sort of esteemed Russian political philosopher. She was assassinated in Russia, and, you know, there aren't many Russian people who would have, you know, wanted this to happen or who would have sort of carried this out. But there were a lot of Ukrainians that celebrated it and, you know, uh, were, were happy about the fact that she was killed. And then, you know, you have the, the Crimean bridge bombing, which Ukraine openly – Ukraine claimed responsibility for. They claimed responsibility for blowing up a bridge within Russia. So, you know – the fact that we're being told that it's preposterous, that we're supposed to feel crazy uh, to even, you know, think that there might have been involvement from Ukraine, which has done, which has carried out terrorist attacks like this inside Russia before is uh, ridiculous. And, you know, I think uh, the U.S. the U.S. government, the State Department wants us to feel crazy. They want, uh, you know, people who are skeptical to feel crazy. They want Russia's narrative to sound crazy, but really, I think calling calling it preposterous to say, uh, or sorry, to say that there's no chance that Ukraine had any involvement before the facts of the matter have even come out. I think that's really what's preposterous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, good points and really important context, I think, obviously, with all these different things swirling around. It's important to, I think, remember some of these deeply contextual points as we move forward. Kay Pritzker, journalist with Breakthrough News, doing many, many great videos here, which is another reason why you should hit subscribe and the bell. Kay, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Rania? Well, Eugene, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to add other than uh, if the U.S. comes out a couple hours after something like that and just makes like a blunt and like a, a claim that you can't really make until there's been an investigation. Mm -hmm. um, it makes me kind of think what the U.S. is saying didn't happen did happen. <laughs> and well, they also tried to say – well, yeah, I was going to say one more thing. They also the U The U.S. government also was like, oh, yeah, and we warned Russia a few late days ago that there was an attack coming. I'm like, did, that doesn't sound, did, did you? Because that sounds like anybody could just say they did that anyway. Well, the Russians are saying they did talk to them um, and that they did have it, but it was just sort of general information is what they're saying. And then something came out. I wasn't able to read the whole story this morning, but I think it was in the New York Times uh, about this exact issue about how I guess they didn't share the totality of the information they had. So that'll ultimately become another subtext of this is what did the U.S. know? What did they communicate and so on yeah. and so forth? But uh, a lot to still be sorted through as we move through, but I think an important, an important issue. But when we're talking about getting the information correct and how the media is reporting things, especially in the West and how governments keep a lot of secrets. Uh, obviously, it brings our mind to WikiLeaks, whose former editor-in-chief Julian Assange remains in prison uh, inside of the United Kingdom as his case uh, moves on in terms of being extradited to the United States. And we are honored, as we always are, to be joined to discuss more on this topic by Kevin Gostel, who is the curator of the Dissenter.org newsletter and also the co-host of the podcast Unauthorized Disclosure. Kevin, as always, thanks so much for being with us. Hey. Good to be with you again. Great to have you. And I, you know, I think. Uh, 
decent number of people, let's just say, undoubtedly saw uh, that there was something happened in Julian Assange's case. I've seen some sort of back and forth. Some people saying this was a big victory for him. Others saying that since it's just a continuation of an appeal, it shouldn't be looked at like that. So what exactly took place uh, in terms of the ruling on his extradition? And, you know, contextually, is this a good sign or are we still uh, in a similar place? I know that there's always going to be a debate on whether you know, the glass half full or half empty, but uh, any day that Julian Assange is not about to be extradited to the United States is a good day. Uh, and it, it means that there's still a potential to fight this and prevent it from doing lasting and grave damage to freedom of the press around the world. Uh, that being said, what the High Court of Justice, the appeals court in the United Kingdom did is essentially telegraph to the United States what they need to do in order to save their extradition case and bring Julian Assange to trial on these political charges. And I find that to be stunning. I find it incredible that they would basically say, we believe that Julian Assange will be exposed to the death penalty. Can you remove our concerns by just saying you won't subject him to the death penalty by uh, adding additional charges? Or there's a concern that came up during the hearing back in February that maybe he would be charged with aiding and abetting treason when he arrived in the U.S. Or perhaps they would add the, the espionage in the classic sense, not as the in the sense of the Espionage Act, but as we understand it, like, oh, you were spying for Russia. So we'll add a charge like that that could carry a death penalty uh, sentence. And so that was on the uh, that was an issue. And the other issue is that the lead prosecutor in this case, an Islamophobic character named Gordon Cromberg, uh, he himself almost uh, sabotaged the U.S. government by putting in a declaration to the court that if Julian Assange was extradited, he could be deprived of any First Amendment rights, that the U.S. government could argue because he's not a U.S. citizen, he doesn't have First Amendment rights while he goes through these proceedings. And that was alarming to the U.K. high court. So now they're saying, just you know, give us these assurances. We've been down this road before. Uh, the uh, U.S. through the State Department could just go to the U.K. Foreign Office, give some assurances, and uh, these promises, which could always be uh, violated or uh, undermined, there's nothing to hold them to these promises. They're, these are promises that are as um, can be as empty as, you know, we're going to make humanitarian aid go into Gaza. We're going to help get more. It, it's of that variety. Um, so uh, this was good that Julian Assange isn't being extradited. It's troubling because the UK High Court is showing that they really have no interest in challenging the United States and that if the U.S. government just says some magic words, Julian Assange can be brought to trial in the U.S. That's interesting. So it sounds like the, that hasn't quite happened yet. Will it? So if that happens, will that happen, first of all? And if it happens, then what? Like, are there still any other avenues to prevent this extradition if the U.S. comes forward and says, sure, you guys, like, it's fine. We promise we're not going to torture him to death. It's going to be fine. Just send him here. Yeah, so, well, they've already said they're not going to torture him to death. That was the subject of proceedings back in, like, 2022. So we're past that. It's already been uh, brushed aside, the idea that our prisons are inhumane and cruel. That's not going to help Julian Assange. Uh, there's going to be a proceeding, probably a hearing on May 20th. That's the next date that can be circled on our calendars. And, yeah, that'll probably be when these assurances are brought before these high court justices. It's probably when Julian Assange's legal team will make all these statements about why we shouldn't trust the U.S. government and why there's reason to doubt what they are saying about the, the, the death penalty or exposing Julian Assange to further charges, etc. Um, and then uh, they'll decide if that's good enough, if those assurances are enough to not give Julian Assange a full appeal hearing. So I, I'm not really sure what they'll do, but if the past is any indication, they'll take those assurances in good faith 
They won't jeopardize the close allied relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. And uh, they won't give Julian Assange an appeal and he will no longer have any way to challenge extradition in the UK legal system. He'll have to go to the European Court of Human Rights where he can make a petition to have them review his case. He can raise all of the issues that he's already raised. And mind you, there were nine different grounds of appeal that were put to this court. Only around about two and a half of them were seen as being uh, valid for him to uh, raise further in an additional hearing. And uh, I just want to quickly make sure that people who are viewing are aware, because we've talked about in the past the alleged acts that the CIA engaged in against Julian Assange. We've discussed this idea or, or, or this reporting that indicates there were plans to kidnap or kill Julian Assange while he was living under asylum in the Ecuador embassy. And uh, I don't know uh, if you have time for me to squeeze this in here uh, during this segment, but I would really like to share with viewers what the UK High Court had to say about these allegations and why they are not going to hear this fresh evidence about the CIA. So this is a direct quote from the ruling. The original allegations were, by some margin, serious enough to bar extradition if the alleged misconduct was in any way connected to the extradition proceedings. The judge's critical finding, however, and they're referring to the district court that originally ruled on this, the, dis the judge's critical finding was that there was nothing to show that the conduct in relation to the embassy was connected to the extradition proceedings. The new evidence does not change that. On the face of the allegations, on the evidence before the judge and this fresh evidence, the contemplation of extreme measures against the applicant, whether poisoning, for example, or rendition, were a response to the fear that the applicant might flee to Russia. The short answer to this is that the rationale for such conduct is removed if the applicant is extra extradited, applicant being Assange. Extradition would result in Assange being lawfully in the custody of the United States authorities and the reasons, if they can be called that, for rendition or kidnap or assassination then fall away. Wow. Wow. <laughs> we, I'm, I'm glad you shared. I mean, wow, that it wasn't related and that, yeah, if they, if they just basically capture him anyway, it's fine. So just to be clear here, what they have said is extradition is a way of saving Julian Assange's life. This mm. is this is how we protect a journalist from being killed by the CIA, wow. a legal court, a legal court that claims to be part of the rules based liberal international order. Wow, you know, this is it's so backwards. Just no, 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 it's like that's incredible. Sorry, I just like me and Eugene are like, what? It's yeah. just shocking. Right. I mean, it's it, it. Maybe some people say you shouldn't be shocked. I can't help but be shocked. It's so ridiculous, and I, I guess it leads to my next point, Kevin. Which you know we talk about a lot, but I think it's always important to 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 remind people. I mean, this vendetta against Julian Assange. Like, what is it that they had? Like, why? It has been so extraordinary the links they've gone through here in almost every possible way on multiple different continents. Uh, you know, even at one point, the possibility of bringing down Evo Morales' plane because they thought, uh, not as Edward Snowden, but either way. Uh, the point being, you know, this this huge issue is related to WikiLeaks. It, what, what is it well, that they hate well, Assange? Well, Eugene, they did put him on a manhunting timeline. That was something mm. we learned from Edward Snowden, that Assange mm. had been put on a manhunting timeline around uh, – 2011, 2012, while President Barack Obama was in office, this this vendetta essentially originates from the fact that WikiLeaks was this organization that had decided they would exist as a stateless news media organization that would be a place that whistleblowers, human rights activists, and others could turn to if they obtained information that was in the public interest and. They encouraged people to go find evidence of torture, war crimes, corruption by governments throughout the world. We need to always refresh people's memories that this organization did not begin as one that was going to specifically try and challenge U.S. empire. It was going to be this organization that 
publish materials from African countries. I think they believe they'd be countering the Chinese government and, and, and their surveillance objectives in the country. You know, it didn't have this orientation that developed after obtaining Chelsea Manning's disclosures, where so much of what it came to be identified for publishing had to do with U.S. wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, had to do with the diplomatic misconduct, the secrets, the things that they were hiding and concealing. And what the government of the United States saw in WikiLeaks was a threat to its ability to maintain its power if there was this kind of stateless organization that did not have any law that it was beholden to uh, because it didn't answer to any particular country's government. Uh, because what Julian Assange wanted to do, what people involved in WikiLeaks wanted to do was incorporate it in a manner so that it would not be able to be attacked in the manner that, let's say, a New York Times or a Washington Post could be attacked by the U.S. government if they truly wanted to be an adversarial media organization. Uh, you know, so like we know that there are a number of U.S. media outlets out there that even though they are state identified media organizations and we always you know, are critical of the way in which they might be more like lapdogs rather than those who challenge power, uh, it is also well known to us that there are boundaries, and if they overstep them, they are going to get in trouble with officials in the United States, and they're going to be told that they're not uh, following the script that is expected as, as people who should support the U.S. agenda globally. I'm just curious, Kevin. I mean, this is one of those situations where you start to feel quite helpless. Um so I want to ask you, like, what can people do uh, to get themselves involved in something that can help, you know, get their voices, uh, you know, in the, the sort of collective spaces of trying to oppose this? Yes. So uh, this may not be something that people who watch your program have any interest in doing, but the call to action right now from the Assange Defense Committee, as well as Stella Assange, Julian Assange's wife, and his brother, Gabriel Shipton, is that there is a House resolution called H.R. 934 that has been introduced. It has somewhere around 15 or 20 members of Congress signed on to it at the moment. And it states very plainly, if you support freedom of the press, then you must demand that the Justice Department drop charges against Julian Assange. And the idea is that you know, the more and more people that could be signed on to it, it might become a political issue uh, within the legislative branch. And then it might be something in which the White House has to take notice and uh, it may end up pressuring the Justice Department to take, take some further action because so far open letters from law professors, civil liberties organizations, human rights organizations, press freedom groups, parliamentarians from around the world. We've had open letters from Latin American leaders, progressive Latin American leaders. There have been, uh, there was a resolution that recently passed in Australia where the Australian prime minister himself actually said, drop this, end this case. We need a resolution. None of that's worked. And what we need to do, the obstacle here that we need to overcome is how do we make this a political issue within the United States. You know, they, they, they did it in Australia, to their credit. The people of Australia who have been campaigning for the release of their own citizen, Julian Assange, from this Belmarsh high security prison, which coming up on April 11th, that's the fifth anniversary of his arrest. He's been in this high security prison for five years. But they did it. They made it a political issue. And here in the United States, we can do that too. We need to, if we care about freedom of the press, free speech, freedom of expression, if we, if we care about access to information, if we care about um, being able to know what the government does in our name, then we have to stand up for whistleblowers. We have to stand up for journalists like Julian Assange. And I'll just say here in closing this comment to you that we just saw this person, Anel Shaleen, resign from the State Department protesting the policy on, on Gaza, she was part of the Bureau um, of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, I believe, and uh, joined Josh Paul, another individual from the State Department who have been principled. And these people who are principled, you know, we have to stand up for them. And I see 
this is all being connected because what's happening in the State Department right now, there, there truly could be somebody who came forward and blew the whistle on the way in which the State Department is handling uh, this case against Julian Assange. Because over the next weeks, couple of months, the State Department is going to intervene in this once again to help ensure that Julian Assange is brought to trial in the United States. They're going to put forward more assurances like they did years ago um, to help Julian Assange get to trial. And we need to know what the State Department is doing to basically pervert all of these ideas around human rights, basically twist and, and gaslight us into believing that Julian Assange is somehow a criminal and not an, an editor or a journalist who deserves protection. And uh, so people can stand up for whistleblowing and freedom of the press by telling members of Congress that this is something that is important to you and disrupting. I'd say if they're at speaking events and you see these individuals and you care about this, do what we've seen happening on the issue of the assault on Gaza. You say something to them. How can you speak about human rights, freedom of the press? World Press Freedom Day is coming. At all of these events, they deserve to be disrupted and told, you have jailed Julian Assange. When will he be free? No, I think it's an important call to action. I hope everyone is following the dissenter.org newsletter. Kevin Gosla, as always, it was an honor. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Freedom Side. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, Rania, I also just want to note uh, that uh, Marty Goodman, longtime socialist activist and one of the most active people in the Assange movement here in the United States, recently passed away uh, a couple weeks ago. So, of course, sending condolences to his family and uh, comrades around the country. So just wanted to mention that in this context. But sorry, you were going to say something. Um, well, I was going to announce the death of somebody else, but not somebody who's important. Well, who's important, yes, but not someone I have any sympathy for. Oh, did Joe someone Lieberman just, has passed Oh, away. Yeah, sorry. I thought someone just died like right now. Yeah. We'll get to Joe Lieberman at the end well, of the show. We'll come but, back to Joe. Yeah. Uh, we've got yeah. our next guest waiting, but we won't forget about Joe. Uh, obviously, you know, many people saw, have seen, I, I don't know who hasn't seen this. If you haven't, I don't know what's going on with you, but the uh, just terrible bridge collapse that took place in Baltimore, the key bridge, Francis Scott Key bridge there. A uh, lot swirling around this issue and to help us get into all of this, we are very, very honored to be joined by Darna Noor, who is the fossil fuel and climate reporter at The Guardian who is based in Baltimore and I know has been there on the ground. Darna, thanks so much for being with us. Hey, y'all. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. And, you know, I just want to start, maybe there's a lot of sort of conversation swirling around about, you know, was this just sort of an unavoidable tragic accident that nothing could have happened? Does it speak to the infrastructure issues? You know, what was going on vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Baltimore in this regard? I mean, what have you been hearing and what's the conversation uh, about sort of that element, the infrastructure collapse sort of angle on the story? Yeah, I mean, it kind of depends who you ask. Um, you know, there are experts who say that um, the bridge was built in like the 70s. And so there are experts who say that it might not have really been built to withstand being around ships like the one that passed it. I mean, the ship that crashed into this bridge was massive, like truly massive, nothing on the scale that would have existed in the 70s. But I've also talked to engineering experts who have sort of said, you know, no bridge could have withstood something like that. Um, you know, should there be ships of that size in proximity to bridges that people are on, that workers are on? I don't know. I mean, that seems pretty dangerous. Um, but I think this also tells us so much about like the issues with our social infrastructure, right? Um, most people in the city were sleeping when the bridge was hit. It was like 1.30 in the morning. Um, but there were workers, immigrants, well, workers from Mexico, from Honduras, from, from various places in Central America, who were the ones who were working the overnight shift, fixing potholes so that people could have a safe ride to work in the morning. And they were the ones who, you know, in some cases have perished. Um, and it's really, I mean, it's just terrible, but it's obviously no surprise that they're the ones who are really bearing the absolute worst brunt of this disaster. Yeah, uh, and to, to speak to that uh, particular element of this just horrific story, you know, what kind of impact has the collapse had on workers in Baltimore? And right now I'm speaking both of those who were working on the bridge and also those commuting. Um, and what has the impact been like in Baltimore as a whole? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think everyone in the city is sort of still in shock. Um, I'm really used to, you know, covering like pretty 
emotional stories about, you know, pollution and about like, you know, economic injustices, about labor violations. I'm used to covering these issues that like deeply affect me. But this time it was like I was calling up experts. I was doing these interviews before I even really knew who was on the bridge that night. So people were, were calling me to say like, you know, are your loved ones safe? And I just had to say, I don't know. Um, I have no idea yet, which was a pretty wild thing. Um, but, you know, again, like the, the workers who I think are the most, uh, the people who are going to be the most um, harshly affected by this are the families of several workers who have, um, who have either been found, um, who have passed away in the waters or um, are presumed dead now. So there's two workers um, whose bodies were recovered. Um, there are four more workers who, um, you know, maybe they will be recovered over the coming days we've yet to see. Um, and their their families, of course, are just going through complete hell right now. Um, I spoke with uh, somebody who was a friend and coworker of of those contractors who were again repairing potholes, um, who was basically just like, you know, these were hardworking people. They were like using this money to support their families here. They were using that money to support their families back home. Um, you know, in their in their home countries. Um, and you know the the level of like disrespect that I think that they've been receiving um, just as insult to injury. Um, there's also, of course, the massive economic effect on like the rest of the city's economy. Um, Baltimore is a port city. Uh, the port that hit the bridge was was leaving the port, um, and right now that port is shut down until further notice. And there are thousands of people who rely on that work. There are thousands more who are, you know, in the sort of contracting businesses, the restaurants, um, the material suppliers who are going to be affected by this. It could have really, really harsh effects for, for lots of people. Um, and then, of course, you know, the bridge itself could take like a decade to rebuild, um, which is going to be really difficult for a lot of people who rely on it to get to work and people who are essentially feeling kind of stranded because their bridge is the only way that they can get into the rest of the city. Um, and so, Pretty, pretty huge effects uh, all over the place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you spoke to this, you know, in, in uh, the first your answer to the first question. But I'm curious to know more about this. And I know you've been talking with folks a, a number of pieces. I mean, the fact that this is sort of focused us in, or maybe should focus us in on on the on the issue of immigration here in this country. Uh, you know, the type of work immigrants are doing, all of the demonization. I mean, this seems to also be an important sort of immigration story in terms of contextualizing, like who is coming here and why, uh, and what they're actually contributing to the U.S. Yeah, I mean, the right wing wasted no time at all um, just like capitalizing on this and doing what they love to do, which is, you know, injecting like a super racist narrative into this, um, saying that somehow the bridge um, was the result of like the borders being too open, which, you know, is just a truly wild thing to say and especially cruel seeing who was worst affected by this disaster. Um, I mean, I, I think it's really it's notable again that like the the workers who were doing that overnight shift um, were, uh, you know, immigrants who were very likely not being paid particularly well. Um, there was there were two people who were actually recovered from the waters shortly after the rescue mission began, and one of them denied health care. And we don't know, like maybe that's because he was totally fine miraculously. Maybe everything was like completely okay. Um, but also, like knowing what we know about the sort of contractors who often work on that bridge, it could also be that he lacked health care, that he lacked immigration status, that he for some reason was scared, even though he fell into the water after being, you know, after being pummeled off of a bridge, that he was scared to receive health care. Um, and I think that that really shows something is really, really broken about this city and this country. I mean, the other, speaking of broken, I mean, the other aspect of this that's gotten quite a bit of attention is these really absurd right wing, just completely racist conversations around uh, DEI and blaming DEI, I believe, meaning like diversity, equality, inclusiveness uh, for the collapse. Uh, and the mayor has pushed back pretty hard against that, saying that the people using that language are just too scared to use the N word. Um, so what's your reaction to this kind of response that we've seen being promoted by the right. Yeah, I mean, I seeing somebody call Brandon Scott the DEI mayor, um I don't even really know what that <laughs> is like um is he just the DEI mayor because he's black? Like or are you saying that he like <laughs> was somehow like a diversity hire for the city, even though people elected him. I don't know. Um, I, I, I feel like this is, it's like so common that the, the right sort of injects this sort of rhetoric, even when they 
they themselves, I think, don't even really know what they mean. Um, also, like, when, you know, this is a majority Black city, there are lots of, like, you know, people of color throughout the city, and they're going to be the ones who are, we're going to be the ones who are, like, rebuilding, um, you know, and bearing the brunt of this fallout. Um, it's not going to be, like, the, whatever, like, the Fox News commenters um, who are affected by this. Um, you know, it's, it's probably going to be um, immigrants, it's probably going to be lots of Black folks who are working to repair the damage, um, who are working to sort of rebuild the economy after this disaster. Um, and that also is going to benefit like the rest of the United States and the world because Baltimore is still a pretty major port. Um, so I don't know. I, I think it's it's like pretty ridiculous and, and honestly doesn't make a lot of sense to me, um, even beyond being cruel. It just seems pretty nonsensical. Yeah, I was so surprised. I was like, do people understand that the mayor is actually an elected official? Like, he can't just be <laughs> chosen. But yeah, I didn't just the, the fact someone even thought they could get something out of it is is wild. Well, before we let you go, Darna, I mean, I know you've been on the scene. You've been talking to others. Anything else you feel people should know about what's happening in the Baltimore bridge crisis that isn't really being covered? Yeah, I mean, I think there's just so much that we don't know yet, right? We're talking two days after this happened. It went down in like the middle of the night. And I think that that made it really, really hard to know the details immediately. But in the weeks ahead, I think there's going to be a lot of questions to answer. Um, you know, it seems like there were some toxic chemicals, for instance, on board some of those ships. What is the effect of that going to be? Uh, Who is going to be bearing the, uh, the brunt of like that toxic pollution? Um, also, with the port shut down, is that going to mean that there's more like massive diesel trucks on the on the streets of Baltimore and particularly in streets of Baltimore that are already super, super overburdened with pollution and, of course, are often, you know, poor and working class and majority places of color? Um, it, it, I think there's just a lot of uh, potential cascading effects from this from this uh, bridge collapse that we don't know about yet. And so I think uh, lots to lots to follow in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope everyone is following your byline. Good to have you there on the ground in Baltimore covering this. And we'll certainly have to have you back. Darna Noor from The Guardian, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Thanks for having me and thanks for all you're doing. Mm -hmm. I still can't believe that image of that bridge. I remember I, so it, it happened like 1.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, which is like, early in the morning Beirut time. So like mm -hmm. one of the first things I saw when I opened Twitter, when I woke up in the morning was this horrific collapse. And I was just like, Oh my God, like that's so insane. Um, and yeah, I just remember like all the, I know this is not why this bridge collapsed. But I remember all the reports about, you know, the potential for U S bridge collapses, mm -hmm. uh, and crumbling infrastructure across the country. And I'm like, geez, like, how is this going to get framed? And, right away there was like the racist stuff and then there was i think that there's been i've seen congress people like right-wing congress people trying to make it like a like democrat versus republican thing and i'm just like what is happening like don't you care that this happened like your bridge collapse and also a part of me was a little bit nervous that it was going to be some sort of like oh this is a terrorist attack situation yeah. and i was like uh oh but anyways the footage is so insane yeah, um, yeah. And terrifying to watch. No, it really yeah. is. I uh, also encourage people to check out the Lever News is doing some reporting on the shipping company that apparently was uh, trying to prevent whistleblowers from saying things over the past couple of years. So another interesting angle to this story. Uh, but yeah, definitely shout out to Darna. Shout out to Baltimore. It's, you know, I lived in Baltimore for a year. A lot of people don't know. There's a lot of very intrepid journalists living and working in Baltimore and bringing out some good news, Baltimore Banner and others that are out there. So please do what you can to follow journalists in Baltimore and support their work and help amplify it because uh, I think it's really important in a city that's so demonized all the time, poster child for Fox News, but really, really a great place and just tragic situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it was. I was also the first thing I saw that morning and it was like, whoa. Really, and if you don't know Baltimore, uh, you know the Key Bridge is like one of the major bridges. I think there's three bridges that cross over uh, the bay there, uh, and so now one's gone. It's one of the major ones. Really, just uh, huge, huge, huge impact. So we'll keep following it. We'll keep watching it. I agree with Darnell. There'll be a lot of cascading effects uh, there as we continue to see what's happening in Baltimore. Uh, we want to try to move forward here in our show. An important story that. Well, I guess it did get some coverage, a fair amount of story, a fair amount of coverage, and that is 
Uh, the recent election in Senegal that took place this past Sunday, which was, uh, as the lower third there says, a game-changing election uh, for Senegal. Some big uh, big potential uh, outcomes here from this election. A lot of jubilation on the streets, which, of course, if you have the opportunity to go to some of our social media, you can see that we have shared some videos that were coming out there from Sunday night with you know thousands of people taking to the streets. So to get more into what's happening in Senegal, why the election has, uh, you know, it seems like such an inflection point, we are very, very honored to be joined here by Amzat Bukhari Yabara, who's a historian, an author, and the president of the Pan-African League, Emoja. Amzat, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, it's really an honor to have you here. And, you know, maybe just to give some context for people who, who don't know as much, haven't been following Senegal, uh, you know, who won the election and why is that has something that has caused such mass jubilation, it seems, amongst especially a lot of young people? Yes, um, Basirou Diomaifai won the election. He was in jail uh, 12, years, uh, 12 days ago. So he was released just 10 days before the election, after 11 months in prison. And um, the real candidate of uh, the Senegalese people was Ousmane Sonko, who is, uh, is a friend from the same political party, the African Patriots of Senegal. But he was barred from presenting at the election. What you need to know is that the incumbent uh, president, Macky Sall, did not want to leave office. So the election was supposed to be held in February, but it was uh, canceled and delayed. And then you had uh, a mass protest, international protest against this decision. And finally, the election took place uh, on Sunday, uh, last Sunday, and uh, Jumai Fai uh, won with 57% uh, of uh, the vote against Amadouba, who was a candidate from the ruling administration. And uh, this is really important because Senegal is um, uh, an example of uh, democracy in West Africa. And uh, since three years, we have many demonstrations, we have many crises in this country. Uh, many people have been killed by the political repression of the former uh, government by Macky Sall. And uh, we were afraid that this election uh, will turn into a, a nightmare, but everything went okay. And uh, the people massively choose uh, Jumai Fai. Jumai Fai is only 44 years old. He's the youngest president in the history of Senegal. Uh, he was uh, quite unknown since uh, te te 10 days, but he's also a member of the African Patriots of Senegal, a founding member of this, uh, of this political party, a senior officer of this political party and is now in charge of uh, the destiny of uh, Senegal, uh, that is a very strategic country in West Africa, and more strategic regarding what is happening today in Sahel. Well, I think it's super interesting that he was also at some point put in detention himself. The leader of his party was had been imprisoned. Um, and now that he has won this election, He's talking about some really important stuff. He's promised to restore uh, the country's institutions. He wants to renegotiate mining and energy contracts and work towards uh, monetary reform, potentially, uh, which potentially includes a new currency. So can you talk a bit about that? What is he like? Wh why is he popular enough to win an election? Uh, and why are these policies that he's promising to pursue in particular popular among uh, people after so many years of these mass demonstrations that you're talking about? Yeah, what, what you need to know is that uh, Senegal is uh, the oldest French colony in Africa since the 17th century, and it became independent in 1960, but it was a false independence. The, the French interest remained in Senegal, and France is the first economic partner of Senegal. And uh, in the last year, we have a movement named France Dégage, France Get Out, uh, which rose be amongst the youth. And uh, most of the youth in Senegal is unemployed and they want economic justice. Uh, they consider that uh, the business friendly policies of the former government uh, was not uh, for the benefit of the people and they want to change the situation. So they was a mass of uh, uh, disenchanted youth 
and also middle class entrepreneurs who supported uh, the candidacy of uh, of um, Jumai Fai, and they want to renegotiate everything concerning the economic system. Uh, another big issue is that Senegal is uh, about to become an oil producer country, and the issue of oil is very uh, strategic uh, because it is um, uh, a large amount of money, and the former government of Macky Sall, his policy was to attract foreign investment and to neglect uh, local investment. And Uh, the policy of Dumaifai and the African Patriots of Senegal uh, is to uh, implement uh, economic patriotism and to um, protect the interest of the people of Senegal. So this is a radical change concerning uh, political practices. He wants to fight corruption. Uh, he wants to, uh, to, uh, to change uh, the country's economic orientation. And the uh, hope for uh, youth is that Senegal uh, could benefit to uh, Senegalese youth. So we have a strong change uh, in the mindset uh, of uh, the political leader. And one thing quite important is is, um, is a young leader. So he, uh, he also spent 11 months in jail. So he know what uh, it means to struggle. Uh, it know what it means to struggle for dignity, and uh, many youth uh, recognize themselves uh, um, in the vision of uh, the African Patriots of Senegal and uh, the candidacy of um, uh, Dioma um, Fai. Uh, so this election is a um, victory for uh, the Senegalese youth uh, who struggle for many years to have a change of system And now the challenge for the new president is to uh, really change the system. And uh, we can say that everything is starting now with this election and uh, we need to support change in Senegal. You know, one of the questions, and you alluded to this earlier, is is how is this connected to some of what we've seen across the Sahel? I mean, obviously, it's different in many ways because it was the the electoral uh, route here which prevailed. But it seems similar themes around, uh, you know, the neocolonial influence of France, the desire for more development, addressing the issues of the youth. I mean, where would you place what's happening in Senegal in the broader context of what's happening in the Sahel in West Africa? Uh, Senegal is seen as uh, stable countries. Uh, it's uh, seen as a um, very important place concerning geopolitical issue. You have many uh, UN headquarters uh, building in Dakar. Dakar is an international city. So you have uh, a US influence in, in Senegal. You have also French interest in Senegal. And uh, the stake is that Senegal contributes to stabilize the Western uh, Africa uh, area. And um, now the fact that we have an anti-establishment leader at the head of Senegal uh, could be seen as a threat for foreign interests. So we have this situation that is quite interesting because uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dioma Fai was elected. He is not uh, coming from a military coup, but he's also the proof that we can change the situation through democratic, um, democratic process. So uh, his uh, ambition is to um, change the ECOWAS, the economic community of West African states, uh, from which uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger decided to withdraw. So what is going on right now is a new, um, uh, a new um, balance of power in West Africa, and the possibility from Senegal to start a new political revolution all over in West Africa. Because I think that uh, this example of uh, Dioma Fai winning the election in Senegal could lead to other change in other African countries on the political issue. And concerning Sahel, uh, the position of Senegal is to stand with uh, the people of Mali, Nafaso, and Niger. So I think that Senegal may be Um, will be probably uh, change the balance of power uh, inside uh, the ECOWAS uh, institution uh, for the benefit of the people and for the benefit of uh, uh, the Sahelian countries. Uh, indeed. And, you know, I think that when it comes to 
pushing back against U.S. empire and the imperialist policies of its allies like France uh, across West Africa. What we see, what we've seen, is there's you know the the global North countries will very quickly be willing to come together to um, intervene in whatever way they can uh, and to block any attempt to for any country in the region to pursue a policy independent of Western interests uh, and one that actually uh, is in the interest of its own people. And so for that, I, I'm wondering if there is a conversation or any fear about a potential imperialist backlash, if you will. Uh, and as a result, is there a conversation about, you know, sort of treading lightly uh, when it comes to how Senegal is going to, you know, be in solidarity with with the neighboring countries uh, and push back against French colonialism and the imperialist policies of a country like the U.S.? Uh, the ideological position of um, the new president of Senegal is uh, left-wing pan-Africanism. Uh, so he's clearly on uh, anti-capitalist uh, basis. Um, uh, can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Oh, yes. Can you? Yeah. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Uh, he, okay. he is clearly. Uh, he, he really wants to um, uh, to weed out corruption. Uh, he really wants to to get away from French colonial relics. So. Uh, the exit from uh, the French currency, uh, the CFA, uh, is on the way, probably. But uh, indeed, it is different to um, be in the opposition and to be in power. So in his first statement, he explains that the foreign uh, partners of Senegal uh, did not have to be worried that uh, Senegal will uh, uh, respect all his uh, agreements. But uh, in reality, he wants uh, that the other countries respect Senegal. So I think that the balance of power is changing because Senegal is not alone. There are other countries in Africa who are starting to resist to foreign imperialism, to US and French imperialism. We can speak of Niger, who uh, decide to expel uh, the US military drone bases in Niger. So we have um, a connection uh, in different parts of Africa. But I think that the case of Senegal is a little bit different because they said from the beginning that they did not want to, to trade with Russia. They want to be independent. They want to choose their partners. And I think that this, uh, this discourse, this narrative, uh, is what we need to hear in Africa. Uh, another issue is the fact that Senegal has a, a huge diaspora in, in France, in the US. And I think that uh, this diaspora should be politicized to understand the role that she could play uh, in the US, in France, in uh, uh, every country where she is, uh, to uh, explain the political position of Senegal today. So uh, we are entering in a new um, geopolitical situation. And I think that this Senegal's game-changing election is... Um, uh, the beginning uh, of a political revolution inside Senegal and Africa, but also in the relation between Africa and the rest of the world, uh, including the foreign former colonial powers and imperialist power of France and the U.S., Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be a lot to watch here. Very interesting. A very hopeful election, I have to say. And we are very, very honored, Amzat Bukhari Yobara, that you would give us some of your time and join us on the Freedom Side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It can't be, uh, it shouldn't be, uh, uh, I guess, underemphasized. Sorry, it's late my time, so I, I start losing track of vocabulary words. Uh, but mm. it, it shouldn't be uh, taken lightly who just won in Senegal. That's like a huge, huge deal. And I'm sure that those sitting in Western capitals are, are very concerned. Yeah, um, I mean, and March, this, as yeah, recent as March 14th, this guy was in jail 
Like, that's the thing people have to realize. Like, literally, this like, two weeks ago, he was in jail. No one had any idea if him or Osman Sanko were going to get out. Were they going to be disqualified? It looked like Maki Sall was going to try to steal the election, but he was unable to do so because there's just been this amazing mobilization. But over a 1,000 people were arrested in this context. 30 people were killed uh, in this struggle that has been going on in a number of, of, of years here, a couple of years here, uh, to really try to change the politics of Senegal. But huge, huge. It's hard to understate. This is like the country that that like the darling of the West, you know, they say, oh, Senegal is so great compared to all these other countries. And it is a great country. Don't get me wrong. Um, but that being said, you know, really, really turning the, the politics on its head. So we'll be interesting to watch the Sahel, West Africa, a lot going on. It really is a lot going on. Uh, and it's not really being discussed, but I, you know, people don't really fully understand that Europe, especially their prosperity is 100% determinate on the ability to exploit Africa. So these shifts in the neo-colonial control of Africa can really shift power relations on a world scale in a way that I think is uh, really notable, quite frankly. Indeed, indeed. Um, well, and I do encourage, by yes. the way, sorry, real quick, before we move on to the next guest, I want to remind people that I know this isn't about Senegal specifically, but this mm. is definitely a part of uh, a broader regional shift. And you and, you and I, Eugene, have done uh, two episodes on the changes taking place in the Sahel. I encourage people to go check those out to learn more. I do too. Another reason to be subscribed and to hit the bell so you get the alerts of the things you subscribe to so you'll never miss any of our great content on any issue. Now we want to turn our attention here to the ongoing genocide in Gaza, the broader issues surrounding Palestine as we get ready to move into land day uh, here on March 30th, an important day on the calendar for the Palestinian people and the Palestinian solidarity movement. And we are very honored to be joined here on the show once again by Leanne Sima Fulahan, who is the education director at the People's Forum and an editor at 1804 Books. Leanne, as always, thanks for being back with us. Thanks for having me back on the show. Well, it's always an honor to have you here with us. And uh, there's a lot of places that we could start, I guess. I mean, perhaps I'll start with this. I mean, last time you were on, we were talking about the context of the ceasefire talks, which are sort of kind of still going on. But this broader issue of the perhaps so-called falling out between Biden and Netanyahu and is America starting to finally distance itself from Israel? All of this discussion is 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 raging. Uh, I mean, what do you make of this sort of political theater issue between Biden and Netanyahu? Is there a real rift here or is it just uh, surface level? Well, on the one hand, I, I do think it's just that. In, in many senses, it's political theater. Um, there, but on the other hand, it is a sign of the United States wanting to at least on the surface distance themselves from what they are assessing to be the more untenable actions of Israel in the eyes of the American public. Reports have been coming out that the majority of American people are dissatisfied with Israel's actions in uh, Gaza in the past couple of months. It's now become that the United States public is fully basically a majority and fully rejecting the U.S. policy of supporting a genocide. What that means, of course, varies from the level of understanding of each person. But what has happened is that the movement for Palestine has changed public consciousness so that there's a new status quo uh, on the streets and in, in all the workplaces, in schools, in, in discussions, and even in the media in some cases, where people are just rejecting the narrative that Israel has a right to commit genocide against the Palestinian people. There has been now in the past couple of months the talk of invading Rafah where over 1.1 million people are uh, suffering from famine. Um, the, the UN has come out saying that famine is looming uh, over, over, over a million people in, in Palestine. These are things that are just unacceptable um, even by people who are not fully aware of the history of uh, the genocide and colonialism of the Palestinian people and um, and are not fully aware of the issues. I think what happened, the political theater that we that we saw in the in last week or this past couple of days um, is significant because we saw the United States feel that they had no other option but to abstain from the uh, from the vote uh, on the UN latest version of the UN ceasefire proposal. Um, it was the first time that they've allowed a ceasefire proposal, even though it is limited in scope, to go through the UN Security Council. And then Netanyahu's uproar against this was very dramatic. He canceled his trip to the White House, but just uh, recently it seems like they're making moves to reschedule the visit. There's not a lot of concrete evidence that the White House is trying to 
uh, put pressure, actual pressure on on the Israelis, which they could do. But they are trying to at least cover up their track work uh, record in the eyes of the American people by starting to use words like ceasefire, by starting to say things like they're uncomfortable um, with with uh, the, uh, the planned invasion of Rafah, um, but they're not exactly, they're not actually doing anything to make that real. Um, it's been very interesting also to see how little effect those adoption, the adoption of the words like ceasefire has actually had. No mm-hmm. one's really been appeased by it. So in the end, it does feel like political theater, but also a sign that the movement for Palestine has been putting quite a bit of pressure on the White House. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then we had this resignation today of the State Department um, official who's, I guess, ex-State Department now. And honestly, the first thing that comes to mind when I see something like that, I mean, good for you for resigning, but why did it take you six months of genocide? Mm. Um, But specifically in it, because she published her reason for resigning in an article on CNN, uh, but specifically in that piece, she mentions that the Biden administration has essentially refused to cut off the tap of weapons, even a little bit, and not just with regard to Gaza, but she actually addressed the fact that there is serious concern that Israel might want launch some sort of bigger war on Lebanon. Um, and that's not to like understate the fact that there has been an Israeli war with Lebanon since October 8th. It's just has not been anywhere near what we're seeing in Gaza, obviously. Uh, but the Israelis do hope to at some point be able to launch some sort of invasion and bigger war. And she noted that there's just no appetite in the Biden administration to basically cut off weapons, which essentially means that there's no real material leverage they seem to be willing to use at this point. Um, And so when the U.S. just kind of shrugs its shoulders, Leanne, and says, look, we told the Israelis to do better and we can't control what they do, there's so much the U.S. can do. Can you talk a little bit about what the U.S. can do to make this stop? I mean, the United States could make this stop. I think the fact that they are unwilling to even take one step towards that is proof enough to the world that this is not just an Israeli genocide. This is a U.S. genocide of the Palestinian people. The U.S. is not just backing it, supporting their ally in the Middle East, as they might want to say. This is a U.S. engineered project of genocide against the Palestinian people. And I think what we have to remember is that Biden and Netanyahu, for all the theater that may that Biden may try to put on and perform, that he's dissatisfied with the more grotesque kinds of statements that are coming out of Netanyahu's office, or he's dissatisfied with certain things that are coming out of the Israeli government, at the end, they're still very close because they share the same goals. Now, the goals may change slightly. The U.S. may be kind of frustrated that Israel seems to be willing to risk an all-out regional war at this stage. Um, U.S. has long-term goals that go beyond just the colonization of Palestine. They want to maintain the the region under its full control and all of its resources. Um, And so that takes a lot more balancing, perhaps, than what Israel is showing that it's willing to do, or perhaps Israel is not exactly seeing eye to eye on certain tactical decisions and is willing to sacrifice um, much of public and international support in this moment in order to achieve what they would consider a military victory. But at the end of the day, they still have the same agenda. And so I think what we need to remember and be very clear on is that no matter what Biden or Kamala Harris or you know, ex-State Department officials or any of these other people are going to say um, who represent in different ways the institutions of the White House, the White House's project is is in fact the colonization and uh, the project of Israel, the colonization of Palestine and the project of Israel. Um, and it's been so from the beginning. I think there's a way in which the U.S. likes to position itself as some sort of benevolent uh, force or mediator force or the mediator of world politics, as it were, the enforcer of the, the world order. But, you know, just after they allowed this, they abstained from the vote in the UN, Matthew Miller, Miller goes out and says that Israel hasn't committed any any crimes, any international crimes. They haven't done anything against that would make them want to hesitate, that would make it uh, disqualified to send weapons to them, that they actually have not committed any crimes against humanity or against the Palestinian people. Um, so you see that actually the United States is willing to continue to prop up this uh, genocidal project um, and not actually make any 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 impacts. They could cut all 
weapons aid. They could call cut all aid. They could rein in completely um, the Israeli project. They could uh, vote for an immediate ceasefire, um, and they could refuse to provide any support for the Israeli project until that is achieved. Um, and they could also force the hand of the Israelis at the negotiating table. Uh, instead, they've been pushing an Israeli agenda. Uh, we once again saw Israel run, walk out of the negotiating room and blaming Hamas for this, um, when in fact it's Israel who has been unwilling to actually negotiate an end to this uh, war on the Palestinian people. They are refusing to agree to any sort of um, agreement that would uh, that would require them to withdraw from Gaza. They they are refusing to agree to any sort of uh, conditions that would require them to stop fully stop military operations. Um, and the U.S. has done nothing to try to rein them in or to force their hand. Um, the only thing they've done is try to appease their own uh, population by saying that they're uncomfortable with it, that they want a ceasefire, and by trying to take up some of the language that the streets have been producing. Um, and it's it's not working. So. No, it seems the opposite is happening and that the movement continues. And I know, Leanne, that there has been a – I believe it's actually an international call. I mean, it is pretty much every year. But nonetheless, for taking on increased residence this year, especially in the United States, for people to go to the streets on March 30th for Land Day, uh, which is a very important day for the Palestinian people. I mean, if, if you could, maybe just give us the context of what Land Day actually is um, and then talk, if you if you could, about what – uh, is happening around this mobilization, what is, is happening in the United States uh, in that regard? Sure. Well, Land Day is a very important day in the history of the resistance against the Zionist occupation of Palestine. Um, it originated in 1976 when Israel announced a plan to seize a further 21,000 denims of land in the, uh, in the Galilee. And the Palestinian people organized a general strike and a mass uprising to protest this. And uh, the Zionist forces responded by assassinating six Palestinian protesters. And since then, the day um, became a commemoration of the martyrs of the Palestinian resistance. And it has developed into a day of for the world to commemorate the significance of the struggle for Palestinian land and the struggle for the right to return for all Palestinians to their land as a symbol of the struggle against colonialism and imperialism worldwide. And we've seen it every year. Um, six years ago, it was very impactful and very important to see the Great March of Return in, in, in Gaza when uh, many, many Gazans, uh, Palestinian people living in Gaza, marched towards the apartheid wall um, and in this kind of Nonviolent, popular uh, mass protest uh, were uh, refusing to submit to the colonial apartheid regime and were met with live ammunition and live fire. Many hundreds were massacred. Um, and so this day has been growing in the consciousness of the world of people who are in support of the Palestinian people and who find also inspiration in the ongoing steadfastness and resistance of the Palestinian people. This year, it's even more significant, of course, because Palestine has become the issue that has woken up and has lit the fire of the movements across the world who no longer want to live under the boot of imperialism. Um, and so we're expecting massive protests on the street this year. And also because the question of, of, of occupation of land is right here on the table. There's many uh, Israeli government and politician figures who are who are looking towards now Gaza and saying that they would like, they're imagining water parks and what they can do with this land. There's settlers who are waiting to come in. Um, there's another 8,000 dunams who ha that have been um, seized in the, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, the question of land and the theft of land is still very active. We've seen multiple events in the United States where real estate companies are selling Palestinian land to Americans, um, to potential settlers, so and, and massive protests against them and massive uprising against them. So this year is looking like it's going to be a very, very uh, major uh, commemoration of Land Day across the world. We've seen major protests in the Arab region for days, going on days this past, this past week. Um, with hundreds of thousands of people across uh, across the region out in the streets. Um, and so I don't expect that to slow down. I expect that to be even uh, more building even uh, greater strength. In New York, we're going to be 
across the city, there's multiple actions planned. We're going to be at 5 p.m. at Times Square, where there's many different contingents from many different sectors of society and of the economy who have organized, who are coming out to demonstrate that the issue of Palestine is an issue for everyone. Um, and there's protests across the country and across the world. So all eyes uh, on the streets on, on land day, because I think this is actually going to show what the real mood of the people is. And the reason why Biden is trying to kind of manipulate his image in many different ways, um, but also the fact that manipulations of words and vocabularies and statements is really not going to appease this movement that has not only been growing in response to the genocide, but is kind of settling in as a new status quo. People are, the consciousness is changing and they're not going to accept anything less uh, or any sort of Band-Aid solution uh, to the genocide of the Palestinian people. Yeah, and I have to say, you know, Leanna, after um, a few weeks after October 7th, as this was the brutality of, of Israel's uh, behavior was becoming very, very apparent just how bad it was going to be. Um, everybody was up in arms. There was protest. People were organizing, um, which was fantastic. But I remember thinking to myself, wow, this is going to be a while. And I was really worried people were going to just kind of eventually get bored with it and move on. I think the Israelis were banking on that. That has not happened. And despite the fact that the media does try to ignore what you said has become the status quo, which is these ongoing disruptions and protests. Um, but just in case there are those watching who maybe still are reading the New York Times and Washington Post and watching CNN, maybe they don't know that there's been actions going on. I'm just curious if one, you can just kind of speak to the fact that this is still continuing at a huge pace. People are still getting radicalized and coming and organizing and learning and getting involved. And also perhaps maybe how people might be able to get involved, especially like if they're, they're in New York this weekend. Well, we could talk for hours about why this mass movement has lasted for so long, um, because it's really incredible. I think many people shared your fear, Rania, that this would be kind of a movement in reaction to the horrors of the genocide. And then as people got used to it, and uh, perhaps it became normalized in the media, that it would slow down. And the opposite has happened. And it shows, I think, the weakness of the U.S. and Israeli strategy towards legitimizing this kind of genocidal occupation and violence that somewhat worked in the past, but never really worked. I mean, there's there's also the, the, the reality of this is that it's the Palestinian resistance that has kept this going because they have not only maintained, uh, uh, not allowed Israel to achieve its military goals, um, but they have shown that a very small blockaded and occupied people are capable of withstanding and uh, making advances against the greatest military powers on, on the earth today. This, I think, is we can't underestimate the impact that this is going to have on oppressed people across the world. And the imperialist forces, the U.S., Israel, and all their allies consistently make the, the mistake of underestimating the strength of people and the strength of the movements against the oppression that they themselves are enacting. Um, and this has happened time and time again throughout history. I think what is very significant is that it has reached the American public. Uh, the American public who has gone through multiple economic crises, has gone through multiple mass uprisings in the past 10 years, um, every single time gaining political experience and gaining clarity about what the White House and its project actually represents for their day-to-day -day life, which isn't very good, um, is fed up with being fed lies and having uh, acts of extreme violence being carried out in their name. And so I think we've seen a combination of factors that has made it so that the movement for Palestine is being sustained now in many different ways across many different sectors with many different kinds of tactical uh, and creative actions. Mass mobilizations have not slowed down. Um, they have been happening on a, at least a weekly basis in most major cities across the United States. This in itself is an achievement. But besides that, there is no way that any politician can go anywhere without being disrupted on the question of Palestine. Biden can't even campaign anymore. 
Um, today, actually, uh, there's a fundraiser for Biden um, that's going to be attended by Obama and Bill Clinton at Radio City in um, New York City. And as we speak, there are people mobilizing all around Radio City, gathering, getting ready to disrupt and be on the streets and make their voices heard. There's no way that they're going to accept that these three major political figures who represent to them the biggest war criminals are going to be able to be welcomed into New York and fundraise uh, without disruption. But even at a small scale, um, the city councilor that wants to speak to the public that hasn't called for a ceasefire is being disrupted. Um, any business, any corporation that wants to that hasn't that is complicit in the cri crimes of uh, the Israeli project uh, is having a campaign against them. Their workers are writing statements. There's a huge diversity of actions happening, um, and it can be hard to get a grasp of all of it. But one way that you can get involved is to check Shut It Down for Palestine. Uh, dot org. That's uh, shut it down for with the number dot, for Palestine dot org um, to find mobilizations and actions in your area uh, to look for the Palestinian youth movement or the answer coalition uh, on Instagram and Twitter and to find different actions that you can get involved in. The People's Forum hosts uh, mass volunteer meetings open to the public every Monday night at the People's Forum in New York City so people can join. Um, and people can submit their own actions to the Shut It Down for Palestine website to, so that other people can connect to them. The truth is, is that people have taken this on of their own accord. And that's been true since the beginning of this movement. It's a self-acting movement that has grown um, and it has grown, uh, has, has created new organizations. It has strengthened people. It has given people new skills. And none of this is going away. People are not backing down and I think are feeling themselves to be uh, empowered and real agents of change in this uh, current time, especially when it's very clear that the White House is being backed into a corner by the movement and their options uh, for maintaining some sort of legitimacy in the public eye are rapidly decreasing. So this is the time to be on the streets. And I think everybody is feeling that and many people are taking it upon themselves to not only be out there, but to build the pressure. Leanne Foulihan, Education Director at the People's Forum and Editor with 1804 Books, 1804books.com. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us here on The Freedom Side. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Well, Eugene, I have to say I am so impressed with the level of participation and ongoing protests that exists around this issue. It's so incredibly important um, that people continue uh, to support Palestinians, to support Palestine, and to oppose this disgusting genocide. I can't believe we're about to hit that six-month point. April mm -hmm. 7th will mm -hmm. be six months. Um and yeah, I just, uh, <laughs> I get demoralized and disgusted like everybody else, especially lately. And I, I, I think it, it means so much that people are still pushing back, um, especially in the U S where the administration has not budged unlike a lot of other countries. Um, mm -hmm. and also the U S position is the most important position. <sighs> Well, uh, for sure. Uh, before we get out of here, did you want to say something about Joe Lieberman? Uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot I want to say, but some of it I won't <laughs> say because it'll be used against me. Um, <laughs> I'll save that for the WhatsApp group chats. No, um, I mean, Joe Lieberman was a horrible person. Terrible politics. Uh, did he become an independent at one point? Right? He did. Like, in 2006, he, he actually and lost then, and the Democratic primary to Ned Lamont, which is in and of itself an interesting thing, over the issue mainly of his extreme support for the Iraq war. He was one of the biggest supporters of the Iraq war. He's actually a supporter of every single intervention. Uh, this is, I remember there's a Boston Globe article about him in 2003. Every intervention from Grenada on he was for. He supported the Contras in Nicaragua. Uh, when the F-22 fighter plane, which is one of these many new planes that barely works, uh, was 
was was coming out, you know, the Air Force was like, well, I think we have enough of them. Joe Lieberman felt, no, that we did not have enough of them and actually manipulated the military budget to send more money to Lockheed Martin and these unbelievable companies. He was one of the number one voices against including the public option in what would become the Affordable Care Act. People may remember Obama said universal health care, or said he wanted a public option and it, as opposed to just universal health care. Well, there are many people who killed the public option in many different ways, including Obama himself. But Lieberman was one of the most strident voices uh, in that regard as well. He was a huge supporter of Israel. In fact, just a couple of years ago, he was praising Biden um, for not being uh, uh, captured by the left of the Democratic Party and standing up for Israel. Uh, you know, and most recently, he was the co-chair of No Labels, which of course is the billionaire-funded astroturf effort to run presidential candidates behind a, you know, well, I'll just put it to you like this. Their dream candidate for this year was Joe Manchin, right? The guy who felt so strongly that the taxes on the rich should not be increased, that there should not be an expansion uh, of any social program whatsoever, the child tax credit. Uh, we could go on and on and on, but that kind of absurd uh, so-called centrist politics backed by billionaires, he was the co-chair of theirs. So, uh, you know, of course, as always, all these stupid people lamenting his death, but I don't think he will really be missed. Um, and his sort of footnote in history, which he is a footnote in history, he's played no major role uh, yeah. in a way that would anyone would remember, will just be as a ridiculous war hawk sidekick to John McCain. That's about all he's got. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm just going to uh, quote Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, the current over overseer of the genocide in Gaza, uh, speaking on his good friend, Joe Lieberman, he said that Joe Lieberman was a, quote, exemplary public servant, an American patriot, and a matchless champion of the Jew and the Jewish state. In my very first meeting with him decades ago, I was struck by his integrity, decency, and civic courage. <laughs> he had a deep moral sense and common sense and was fearless in his defense of truth. He was also an extraordinarily kind and loyal personal friend. So what I would say to that is that Benjamin Netanyahu is a proven liar. So just assume Joe Lieberman, I'm confident in saying this, was the opposite of all of the things I just said. Yes. Quoting Benjamin Netanyahu, of course. Also, yeah, like this guy was like a raging neocon lunatic, basically, who gave like, I guess, like uh, democratic legitimacy to every disgusting neoconservative adventure. Uh, in all his time serving in office. And on top of just being a horrible person, he was so whiny. Like that whiny Joe Lieberman voice. Oh, it's like nails on it. It's like nails on a chalkboard like that bad. You know, I'm right. His voice was so whiny. Well, I, you know, I was, I'm going to stay on the substantive critiques here, but on that note, yes, let's, add let's insult to Joe injury. Lieberman to add off. Insult to uh, injury. I had not even really thought about him for years, and then here he is. But anyway, long story short, uh, we're coming towards the end of our show. Rania, is there anything you'd like our viewers to know before we get out of here? Yes, I want to encourage those who are watching to, one, make sure you've hit that like button. Make sure you smash that like button. Smash it's very, that very important. like button. Yes. Uh, it's very important in the algorithm that we get all the likes we can. Um, moreover, it's also super important that if you are able to, if you have the means to, please do become a member of Breakthrough News by going to patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. We're in a very tough media environment uh, where we're just like surrounded by tsunami after tsunami of horrific corporate media lies. Uh, and so it's more important than, than ever to support independent media like Breakthrough News. Uh, so please do become a member where you can access exclusive content exclusive merch, but more importantly, help us sustain Breakthrough News, help us grow Breakthrough News, patreon.com slash Breakthrough News. Indeed. Well said. Well, that, as always, brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell so you get everything you subscribe to. But for myself, for Rania, for our whole Breakthrough News team, we will see you next time. <laughs> Everything that gets in its way, that gets in its way.